Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our asset allocation update. And as usual, I'm joined by Ros Price, our Chief Investment Strategist, and Alex Scott, our Senior Investment Manager, to go through our views and opinions following our last asset allocation meeting, but also obviously bringing that up to date. So good morning, you two. Morning, Justin. Morning. Um, so this time, actually, we've uh, gone about a slightly different way, and uh, Ros and Alex have come up, as you'll see from the slides, which I hope you'll be able to see on the website, uh, which we'll, as we'll talk through as we go through this morning, but a different way of actually summing it all together by a slide called Big Themes, where you put it all together, Roz, with learning to fly. Do you want to talk us through this? Yes. As you all know, we have a series of scenarios that we work, we work through uh, and their outcomes. And I, just for information, we chose Pink Floyd this time. So we started with the dark side of the moon, then we had Uncomfortably Numb, Learning to Fly and Wish You Were Here. Shows your age. I'm not unhappy to say I'm 61. Um... Learning to fly was the one with the highest probability after our asset allocation quarterly meeting. And it's our central premise that this is the process of healing in the global economy, after all the mess of the credit crunch and the banking crisis and all that. Now, you must be bored with us saying that the damage caused was enormous, and it, after a collapse like that, it is going to take a considerable amount of time for everything to recover. So you won't have a normal cyclical recovery. You'll see some of the cyclical recoveries, but they will be swamped by everything else. But now we feel there are real signs of life again in the global economy. I mean, you might need a magnifying glass to see them in places, but led by the US, particularly with the housing market there, we see gradual growth coming back, even, might I say, in the Eurozone. Um, it's led by central banks watering the garden of growth with money, should I perhaps add. But watering, this is a flood though, surely, is the amount of money? No, there could be a lot more. Reckon? Yeah, yeah. could be a lot more. Um, and we don't see inflation as a problem in this growth either yet because there is not excess monetary growth um, going into technical things. Um, and we just feel that, you know, it's, it's like getting over a very, very bad illness. Slowly but surely, you get better. There are setbacks, there are days you feel awful, and then you get better again. Okay, well, let's just dive down into a bit more detail now. And what we'll do is uh, do our usual trip around the world to highlight the key areas. Um, Alex, first of all, United States, what's happening there? Well, Ros mentioned the, the housing market in the US, and I think this has been a, a, a real key positive development for us. We've always talked about the housing market in the US as being the epicenter of the, the, the crisis that's developed over the last six or seven years, uh, the collapse in that housing market and the damage that did to the financial system. The repair, or the, the initial stabilization, but subsequently repair and recovery that's been going on there, with prices rising in, um, in most of the key cities around the US, uh, has been been very, very significant. What we're seeing now is not just those prices rising, but we're seeing more house building activity, more transactions going on, and recovery in mortgage lending in the US. And that's giving some real positive momentum. It's allowing the economy, the recovery in the US to broaden, to deepen, to spread to other sectors. Um, as well. Broader confidence. Right? Broader confidence, absolutely. I and mean, the, the, the benefits from the, the, the repair in that housing market are very significant. It, it, it creates a wealth effect in the economy. It creates jobs directly. It enables people to perhaps to refinance to cheaper mortgage deals and, and improves consumer spending. It's got a host of beneficial uh, impacts on the broader economy. You've got a slide on employment recovery, but last week we did have a little bit of a hiccup on that, didn't we? We did. We saw relatively poor data uh, on Friday last week for the, the monthly readings for, for US jobs data. And that's that's clearly a uh, concern or certainly pause for thought um, after what's been really quite a, a reasonable trend for many months in US job growth. So, of course, questions are being asked, is this a loss of momentum? Is this the impact of... Um, the, 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 the tax rises, the sequester, the sequester the, the, yeah. the, the, exactly, the, the, uh, the, the tightening that's been going on in the US economy. And it's possible we are seeing some impact from that. Um, I mean, I have to say, we've seen the initial data on the US job markets being revised up month after month after month. Uh, so it would not be surprising to see that again this time. That remains to be seen. Um, 
But I think the broad trend is still in place, that we're seeing recovery, we're seeing the US economy able to shake off what's being thrown at it, whether it's the, the challenges from overseas or whether it's the uh, fiscal tightening as, as the US government tries to sort out its own spending. But it's position. got budget discussions going on right now. This surely has to be sort of central to the success of the recovery, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Um, but I think, I think what the US is having to try and do is to balance the long term and the short term. In the long term, it's very clear that there is a, a fiscal problem. The US is spending, uh, is overspending relative to the tax that it's raising, and that has to be addressed. Um, but its answer it's a, is getting to growth. It's a better time to address it now than it would have been two years ago. The US has got some economic momentum. It can afford to start addressing uh, that long-term fiscal challenge. The challenge, as you quite rightly say, is doing it in a balanced way uh, to make sure that the brakes are not put on too hard. We think the balance is looking about right, um, but clearly there are risks around that. On your slide, you mentioned share oil there as being a game changer. Yeah, I, I think it could be. I mean, we, we, we think there are potentially quite a lot of impacts from the development of, of shale oil. I mean, leaving aside uh, em environmental uh, concerns, which are, which are clearly very significant, but looking at it from a purely economic view, what we're seeing is a lot of investment going into many regions around the US. So there's capital spending, there's job creation uh, as a result of this. But also, if you think about the impact that cheap energy will have on the US economy, uh, on US companies, their ability to compete strongly, to maintain strong profit margins, uh, it could be a very significant long-term development for the US economy. Okay, we'll come back to that, I think, probably in some of the other points a little bit later. Ros, Japan, are we finally going to see some changes? Well, I think I've said this every year for the past 30 years. <laughs> You're quite right, Justin. I mean, Japan's economy has been in the doldrums for so many years now, uh, really since 1989, and we've had several attempts at it recovering uh, in the mid-90s, in the mid-noughties. Uh, Admittedly, some of the collapse back are caused by natural effects where you've got um, earthquakes, a Kobe springs to mind in the 90s. But now in Japan, we have yet again a new prime minister, Shinzo Abe, and he is promising the electorate that he's going to bring a more dynamic economy. Hang on, well, I've heard of him before because we had him before. We <laughs> had did. those policies before. We have. Uh, we have exactly had those policies before. And... What we have now is a new governor at the Bank of Japan who seems to be taking a much more positive view. Uh, Japan almost invented quantitative easing in the past, but it did it in a much more timid amount than perhaps is being done now. Um, the new guy, Mr. Kuroda, had his first meeting last week. And the Japanese market has been going up and the currency going down in anticipation of monetary moves that, that Japan would, in effect, print a lot more yen. Uh, but this is the more than quantitative easing. This is quantitative Niagara. Isn't oh, it, it is. <laughs> it is. It's it's a complete you know flood of money in Japanese terms that we've just not seen before, and it's going to buy you know you name it, and it's going to buy it, uh, including I might add foreign bonds, and which uh, is very important for Europe. That's uh, well, including uh, eurozone bonds. I yes, mean. yes, uh, particularly France for some reason, but uh, they they like France apparently. Um, they had their first meeting last week, and markets were expecting a certain amount of quantitative easing, but shall we say, not only did they get more, but they got an enormous amount more of the same techniques of quantitative easing, but lots of it. So it's quantitative easing and a weak yen, that's the yes. bet, is it? Yes, yes. Uh, they're going to be careful about the yen because the point will come when everyone will cry foul, currency war, etc. But for the moment, people are allowing it. But not just currency war, there are other concerns as well in the region, and not least of which, whether it's Korea, but also those disputed islands again. Uh, yes, there is, shall we say, a slight hint of antagonism between the Chinese, who of course also have a new regime in place since March, and we had the final handover and we have a new president and prime minister. Uh, and Japan, Mr Abe has a, a fairly nationalist uh, agenda outside the, the economy. He wants to change the constitution so the Japanese can once more have their own standing army. And he wants to change the history um, curriculum for schools so it reflects the past of Japan more accurately in his view. He is very nationalistic and this could be worrying. So that could be a, a significant risk. But at the time being, we have, you've run this story for some months. Though, we have, you? yes. So it's uh, on the basis of we, hope and expectation. Markets have loved it, and we're now up to about 15,000 on the Nikkei. 
Still a long way to go to 39,000, but you know, well, yes, we're getting there. A while ago. It was so a bit. The slide we've got on there does show there's a line at the bottom, which is yes. almost flat quantitative yeah. easing, monetary easing, but that, of course, is now going to leap up, isn't it? It should do, and it just shows you the scope they have when you compare it to the Bank of England, who seems to be in the lead, and uh, the Fed. OK, let's move on from that. Alex, let's come back home. United Kingdom, not much growth. I think that probably sums up quite a lot at the moment, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I think it does. I mean, it's it's fair to say the economy is is not in uh, wonderful shape, uh, sluggish overall, um, but but perhaps stable or steady degree of sluggishness. I mean, I think I think we can we can either avoid the triple dip recession or or it not be a severe recession from here. And I think one of the reasons for that is that we're seeing the consumer sector, we're seeing households perhaps holding up a little better than uh, than fears. There's a, there's a little more optimism there, perhaps. Still weakness in the construction sector, in capex, in the oil and gas industry, and then some of those other areas facing finding life a little more difficult. The budget didn't seem to do very much to inspire people to think no, I think that's right. I mean, no, no major change. I mean, by and large, we're sticking to Plan A, which is austerity and, and um, you know, careful approach to keep the gilt market under control and keep Britain's international creditors happy. Um, that 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 certainly seems to be the picture that that holds for now. And I think even if we did see a major change in monetary policy with the new Bank of England governor coming in in the summer. Um, that would be more likely to play out in, in the currency markets with, with an impact on sterling if the new governor looks to bring in a, a, a bigger degree of quantitative easing or of, uh, of looser monetary policy uh, here in the UK. Um, so I, I think sluggish on the economic front. I think the political situation looking uh, rather challenging and um, coalition stress is perhaps becoming more of a factor as we get closer to the next uh, election. And of course the issue of Scotland as well. Well absolutely, well. I mean the prospect next year of the, the, the referendum on, on Scottish independence, um, it may or may not uh, be, be a, uh, an event that actually comes about, but I'm, I'm personally rather surprised the markets are taking so little uh, note uh, of, of this event, which, which clearly has risks for you know, what the future of the UK looks like, what the gilt market uh, would look like in such a scenario, uh, what implications there would be for currency markets. I know last time we were discussing this, we were concerned about the gilt market, particularly the duration. Um, have your views changed, and, and what have we done about that? No, I mean, w we would still see gilts as relatively unattractive. I mean, yields have actually um, fallen over the last month or so, uh, back below 2%, around 1.8% now for the 10-year gilt. We think that sort of yield uh, from government bonds, well below the rate of inflation, is, is not particularly attractive. We don't think yields are going to rise rapidly this year. Um, Inflation is still reasonably under control. We've still got strong buying of gilts from institutions and from the Bank of England, of course, with, with QE policies out there. So there's not really a huge amount of pressure for gilt yields to, to rise very strongly uh, or very quickly. Um, but we think there are probably better places for investors' money. OK. With the UK, of course, we're in this rather strange position where we've got the FTSE 100, which doesn't really reflect much of what, what's happening in the United Kingdom. No, I think that's right. I mean, the, the UK economy obviously matters greatly for what's happening to sterling and to the gilt market. But for the FTSE 100, the largest UK companies, only around 20% of revenues for those companies actually derive from the UK. And what about the FTSE 250? People often focus that as a much more UK-centric. Well, it is more UK-centric, for sure, but it's still uh, a, an index of companies that are very international in their exposure. And still around half of earnings for uh, FTSE 250, the medium-sized companies on, on the stock exchange, are coming from overseas. So a weaker sterling in that case is actually quite beneficial? Weaker for sterling is beneficial for earnings. I mean, it's beneficial for the UK economy in many ways in terms of improved competitive position and so on. But of course, for those companies with overseas earnings, weaker sterling exaggerates or increases the value of those overseas earnings. And of course, for investors as well, for UK-based investors like, like ourselves, um, Weaker sterling means that the value of the investments we hold overseas, denominated in other stronger currencies, uh, is increased. OK, let's move on. Uh, over the channel to the Eurozone. Ros, your views here. I haven't really changed my views uh, that I've held for some time now, as you, you're probably all aware. 
I think that Europe is carrying on on its path, or the Eurozone perhaps I should say, to greater economic efficiency. It's slow progress, I know that, but it is progress. And markets recently weathered the Cyprus problem, I thought, remarkably well. Um, the press here was playing it as it was going to be another end of the world scenario, and it, it just wasn't. Uh, then I have to say there were some very unique characteristics about the way that the Cypriot banks are structured. Uh, very few international loans that could take a haircut for the refinancing. So maybe that's why it did not cause the chaos that some were predicting. Uh, then we have a little problem also with Portugal. The Constitutional Court has said it is not fair to remove the extra two-month payments for a lot of the civil service. So the Portuguese government has come out and said, OK, well, we'll just cut the number of them full stop. So you don't see this as major issues? No. It's embarrassing, they but that's are, about it. They are serious niggles on the way, but they're not major issues. That, In in sense, I think that 12 months ago, people were expecting the euro to vanish overnight. OK. But certainly with something like Cyprus, I mean, OK, that was probably a boil waiting to be lanced in terms of its banking system, but presumably we are, we have probably upset the Russians in the process of this. Um, yes, but they don't belong to the EU, so did that matter to the EU? Mm. Probably not. Until they start mucking around with the gas tax, I suppose. <laughs> well, um, that's true. On your slide, you reference their OMT. You better explain OMT. what that is. This is the thing that uh, Mario Draghi and the ECB produced last September. You, people might remember his, his famous sort of statement last July when he said that, you know, the ECB would do whatever it takes to support the euro. The important words were not that. It was and believe you me, it will be enough, because that basically told the market, don't bet against us, we can write more euros than you can uh, produce. And it's certainly effective, yes. it's had the effect on yields, hasn't it? And yeah. yields haven't really gone back up with the bad news yeah. from Cyprus and Portugal. I know, and the only two, it's the uh, open market transaction that, that everyone was looking for, and actually they've been very clever, because they haven't actually used a euro yet. Hmm. This is, it's there in the background as a threat. Now, actually, you put on the slide after this, which you've actually got here, is where is the growth? And you can see in 2013 on the IMF forecast of 14, actually some really quite positive-looking figures of growth. Yet at the moment, we can't see it. No, you can't see it, but what you have to do is poke around in the guts of the individual economies, and then you can see that things like uh, the reform programmes that do take time, but in places like Portugal, even Spain and Italy, um, things like general competitiveness have improved remarkably. The level of exports from Spain, Italy and Portugal have gone up a lot. Inward investment, particularly to Portugal, is good. And of course, the poster child is Ireland, who not only seems to have gained a little bit of growth, they've actually managed to access international bond markets to raise you know, revenues for the government, which is ahead of a programme. So, so exports up, and you're saying that the productivity figures have been improving as well, even in somewhere like Greece. Even in somewhere like Greece, which, according to some data, it is actually on a level now in productivity with Germany itself. Albeit they're not necessarily producing the same sort of no. goods that uh, uh, Olive Germany. oil is not a Daimler, but you know. Um, but uh, the current account balances as well, some of those seem to be changing. They are getting positive. much more positive. So it's not all bad, much as people in, in the media sometimes like to paint it. Okay. Um, Alex, let's just sort of pull this some of this together. What keeps you awake at night? Because this isn't just all a rosy picture. There's got to be some worrying issues. No, it's far from it. I mean, we've, we've talked really about our central scenario, our, our learning to fly scenario, but we certainly look at the, the dark side as well. I and mean, we, we, we talk about um, more concerning scenarios that, that could potentially face us. And one of those clearly is the, the dark side of the moon scenario, where we would worry more about policy mistakes. This is, this is perhaps central bankers getting things wrong uh, and causing damage to the recovery. Perhaps by move, removing the monetary policy, the, the QE policies that have been supporting recovery over the past couple of years, removing those too early or too sharply uh, and snuffing out the growth that's uh, that's been developing in, in the global economy. And your view of this moment, is it likely to be, to be are these policies likely to be withdrawn or they'll stay at, with At the them? moment, no. I mean, I think more likely is that we'll see uh, these policies enlarged before they're withdrawn. I mean, certainly the market's very much focused on the US as being the place where likely we will see QE stopped or reversed 
first. But even there, I think uh, statements from the, the, the Federal Reserve and the, the, the members of the committee there uh, have been pointing us very much to expect it not to happen yet. Remind us that it will happen and markets clearly will face a, uh, a, a potentially challenge, challenging period to negotiate when that withdrawal does come. Uh, but I think a fairly strong reminder that we're some way from that yet. I presume they'll be looking at their issues if there was any inflationary there as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it. right. And at the moment, inflation uh, is, is not a major threat for the global economy. Um, we're not seeing wages uh, increasing strongly. Um, and that's because of the relatively weak labour markets or the slow recovery in job markets that we're seeing around the world. Without strong wage inflation, and indeed with with pullbacks in quite a lot of raw materials and commodity prices as well. We just don't see that inflation pressure coming through. Yes, there has been QE, there has been an enormous amount of money, money printed, but because so much of that money is not flowing around the economy, it's just sitting within the banking system, it's not terribly inflationary at the moment. So it's one of the issues is we can't get this money supply moving fast enough. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, Rose, what, what keeps you awake at night? Mine tend to be, my worries tend to be on the political uh, scenario. I mean, things like North Korea, nobody expected three weeks ago that we would think that we would be where we are with, with Kim Jong-un threatening war with the South. Um, everybody's very sanguine about this, as I know it won't happen. But he is only a person and he could actually make a mistake. And, that, you know, it's that type of political error that, that does worry me. And... The real tensions, the antagonism between China and Japan over the not just over the islands, Justin, but you know lots of other bits and pieces that they fight about. There's a lot of history. There is an awful lot of quite unpleasant history there, and that does worry me, particularly because the new regime in China have stated that they want to to cosset the military and bring them up and they're building, you know, new aircraft carriers, things like that. At the same time, Mr Abe, aside from his his uh, inflation encouragement, he wants to make the constitution changes in Japan that will allow them to have a proper standing army. Uh, he says he needs to be able to depend, defend himself, and of course then that's the Korean situation. Uh, I don't like that at all. Um, that seems to me something somewhere has the potential to go wrong. Okay, well, let's turn it round then and look at something more built on the positive side in terms of this. Um, Alex, what are you looking at which is a bit more positive? Well, I think there are um, optimistic signs around the world. I mean, we talked about the US quite a lot already and uh, optimism that growth can be sustained there. It's not impossible that growth runs ahead of market expectations there. We've talked a lot about Japan and, and evidence so far uh, that policymakers are delivering. They're delivering what, what markets had hoped to see in terms of uh, QE and policy steps there that, that could address deflation. I think we can feel optimistic that the milestones are being hit, if you like, in terms of the right things being done real optimist might say that yes actually some of that policy could work and if that is the case then um, then there could be real excitement there I guess optimism on Europe as well in the sense that uh, the the existential crisis that that's been faced down over the last couple of years does appear to have faded quite significantly and we can start to feel a little more optimistic about growth coming through even in the southern European economies next year as the impact of austerity fades what about in terms of, um, we've seen the corporate results now starting to come through for the next quarter, I know this is very short term, but you know, so far the margin seems to be pretty good and these corporates sitting on lots of cash. Uh, are, is this an encouraging sign and do you think they'll start actually using some of this cash sometime soon? I think with the, con the consumer in, in the developed economies, they may well start to feel more confident. In fact, I think in the States, Alex, we've had, we've had numbers from PMI's purchasing manager and also from consumer sentiment that, that they will pick up. And then companies might use that cash. Instead of sitting on it, waiting for a government to take it off them via higher taxes, they may actually invest, build new plant, take on new equipment, more people. And that, that's something that one could be more optimistic about in the developed world. Okay. So it's a question of confidence, really, I suppose. It's a question that? of confidence. Let's move on, then, to the portfolios themselves and uh, what we've been doing here. Ross, can we start with the issue of foreign exchange, which is absolutely crucial? Foreign exchange plays a very big part in our portfolios because we have international diversification, truly global investment. Um, on our currency, we, we have, as Justin pointed out earlier, been 
quite positive on the outlook for the J Japanese moves to get the economy going again, although we have thought for a long time that that means the yen must weaken. And therefore, we're running pretty much a fully hedged position in our overweight yen. Um, we feel that the dollar, going on with that old maxim, strong economy equals strong currency, we look for the dollar to actually be reasonably strong, and therefore we're not hedged there. Uh, the euro, we also think, to recognise the improvement in the European economy and structure, um, is going to see the euro picking up a little bit. So we are unhedged on the euro also. We feel sterling at the moment. Again, the economy, back to the maxim, the economy weak, sterling not the strongest of currencies. Okay, so that's under control. Alex, what about equities and all their various well, colours? We think you need to be overweight equities still at, at this point in, in the cycle. Uh, that that stance served pretty well through the first quarter of the year, but with the stabilising economic outlook, with the, the falling off of some of the more concerning tail risks that have been out there over the last year or so, and still with pretty reasonable valuations for, for equities, particularly if those earnings do come through as, uh, as investors are hoping, uh, then equities still look to be the asset class of choice. I think after the strong gains that we've seen in the first quarter, and indeed the, the latter part of last year, it may be reasonable to expect some volatility or perhaps a slower process of, of uh, equity market progress. And the major from markets here. or the secondary? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're at least pretty fully weighted in, in most of the equity markets, but I think we, we have some strong regional tilts within that. We're focused very much overweight on Japan, uh, big overweight there, where we think the, uh, the optimism over monetary policy moves can run a lot further. We still have a a focus on Europe. Uh, that's really a value play uh, where we think equities there are good value relative to uh, their global cousins. Um, and we're also increasing weightings to some of the, certainly in the more aggressive portfolios, uh, to frontier markets, emerging markets, or those less developed emerging markets, perhaps at, a, uh, at an earlier stage of emergence, where earnings are growing much, much more quickly than uh, developed markets, and where valuations still are really, really cheap. Okay. Ros, government bonds? Um, we're not overweight government bonds. We are underweight there because we do feel that even if yields are to drop to zero, the, the total return available from that is not actually that great. We don't think the great rotation that has been much written about is actually happening at the moment, and the stats from the US and other bond markets, government bond markets, completely say the opposite to the great rotation. Money is still flowing in large amounts into government bonds, uh, but we don't think they're terribly attractive. So we've taken steps to shorten duration. We've also moved into other government areas in Europe where combined with the strengthening currency and you have a high yield and we're happy with the backing of the ECB through the OMT. So we bought uh, Italy and Spain in a larger size than we had before. That's a theme you've been having for some months now. That I it? think, yeah, I think we first bought them just over a year ago. Uh, OK, let's move on. Uh, Alex, corporate bonds, credit and the alternatives as well. Yeah, uh, we do still see value in, in corporate bonds, certainly relative to government bonds. I mean, y yields on better quality corporate bonds are not terribly high, uh, but I think they're, they're preferable to government bonds. High yield bonds are still uh, looking pretty reasonable, pricing in much too high a level of defaults. We think there's value there, and value as well in emerging market debt. So we're, we have uh, been building exposure there. Elsewhere, um, I think with low concerns about inflation, uh, we've We've taken out our gold and commodities positions from portfolios. Um, and elsewhere in alternative markets and alternative asset classes, we've been building up both in real estate, but particularly in listed private equity as well, which we see as a very good way uh, to play uh, equity markets in the recovery and risk. Appetite. And the real estate was primarily the states? So the real estate is through global property companies, right. so uh, heavy exposure to the US and Asia to some extent as well, which of course includes Japan, yeah. uh, where property and property companies are a real potential beneficiary from government policy. Okay. Alex Ross, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope you found that helpful, um, giving you a brief outline. Uh, the slides are on the website, uh, and if you do need in, uh, more information, please do contact your, our, your local regional relationship manager, and we're delighted to give you more information. One other word, um, Ros and Alex, thank you also for the performance you've been giving here. It's been doing exactly what we wanted it to do, uh, and, and more, which is great. 
providing the sustainability and predictability of returns, which is, of course, why we set up seven in the first place. Uh, in the meantime, thank you all for, for dialing in and listening. I hope you found that worthwhile. May I wish, all, wish, wish you all well with your business uh, and also for your clients. Thank you for your time and look forward to hopefully speaking to you in the next quarter. Thanks a lot. Goodbye.